Welcome back guys, it's Rabid and if you've been uh, following me or watching my other videos you know that I am taking the real estate salesperson program in Humber. Uh, the course is online and uh, I've been summarizing each module to help myself and while helping myself I'm hoping that uh, my summarization or whatever I read out to you guys does help you. Um, you can you can play this in your car and while you're not uh, really studying you can listen to my uh, listen to my summarization and then maybe and learn something while you're driving or going outside you know just listen to what i have to say and uh, hopefully that help that'll help so today we're going to be summarizing uh module six in course one uh, there are about uh, 15 lessons i believe but uh, we're gonna go through them quickly uh, so let's start. <clears throat> Lesson one, module six, they talk about contracts. So the definition of a contract, a contract is broadly defined as a legal, legally binding agreement between two or more persons uh, competent at law to enter into such an agreement for consideration or value to do or refrain from doing something lawful. Contracts may exist in many forms, including oral contract, word of mouth, uh, letters, or legal documents. The underlining intention of any contract is that it shall be binding to it to the parties. Uh, and then talk about le legislation impact impacting contracts. Legislation impacts the preparation of agreements for the sale or lease of real estate. Statue of fraud requires that all contracts involving the transfer of ownership of real estate must be in writing. Vendors and Purchases Act, Purchasers Act deem cer deems certain information to be included in every agreement uh, of uh, purchase and sale. REBA identifies certain uh, requirements for the content uh, and delivery of uh, real estate agreements. The types of agreements, there are various types. Uh, agreements signed between the brokerage and the seller or the buyer, such as a representation agreement. Uh, agreements signed between the brokerage the seller or buyer, such as a seller or buyer customer service agreement, uh, agreements signed between the seller and buyer, such as agreement of purchase and sale, uh, agreement signed between landlord and tenant, tenant such as uh, agreement to lease. The parole evidence rule provides that oral evidence is indismissible in court to vary or con contradict the term of terms of a written contract, except in any in a case of fraud or mistake in real estate every party to the contract must agree in writing to the, any terms or additions to any agreement <clears throat> to be enforceable any changes to the original document need to be agreed to by the parties in writing the privity of con contract the general rule is that only parties to a contract can enforce it or be bound by it only the seller or the buy and the buyer who are the parties to the contract can be considered as a privy to the contract as such if a breach of a contract occurs any lawsuit would likely be between the seller and the buyer however depending on the content conduct alleged by the plaintiff uh, brokerages and real estate salespersons may be added to uh, may be added as parties to any uh, lit lit uh, lit litigation so that was lesson one basically just talks about uh, contracts lesson two is uh, requirements to create a bonding contract okay so the summary of this lesson <clears throat> lesson two is the essential elements of a contract <clears throat> a salesperson needs to be able to recognize what um, what makes a contract valid for a contract to be enforceable the following elements are essential offer and acceptance there must be mutual agreement between the parties capacity of parties there must uh, the parties entering into a contract must be legally competent of sound uh, mind and legal age of majority to make a contract consideration each party must receive something of value Def definite and clear the subject in terms of agreement must not be vague but stated cl clearly lawful object the contractual arrangements must be lawful. Genuine intention. Both parties must 
consent to the terms of the contract. Mistakes: A salesperson should be aware of any uh, uh, should be aware of the kind of, or kind of mistakes to prevent any uh, occurrences or recognize when they occur. The mistakes that can contribute to a contract lacking genuine intention are broadly grouped into three categories. Common mistakes. Common mistake occurs when both parties to the contract know the intention of the other, accept it, but are mistaken about an underlying fact. Mutual mistake is when uh, the parties misunderstand each other and are at cross purposes or have a contrary understanding. Unilateral, uh, un, un, unilateral, unilateral mistake, sorry. <laughs> Unilateral mistake occurs when one party is mistaken about a fundamental aspect of a contract. And then uh, misrepresentation. A salesperson should know how to avert any misrepresentations and also be able to identify the consequences of different uh, kinds of misrepresentation. Uh, the three misrepresentations are innocent misrepresentation, a statement by one party of a fact that is wrong but is honest honestly believed to be true, uh, fraudulent misrepresentation, a false statement made, knowing it is false with the intent to induce the other party to enter a contract, negligent misrepresentation, a false or misleading statement made without reasonable verification of its accuracy. And then they talk about void and uh, or voidable contracts. A salesperson must be able to recognize the uh, deficiencies in a trade document that may render it void or voidable. A salesperson must not do anything that may be neg uh, negatively impact that may negatively impact the integrity of the contract or compromise the co client's legal position. A leading practice is for a salesman salesperson to rep recommend to the seller or buyer to seek legal advice before signing any purchase documents. A contract not fulfilling all requirements may be one of the following. Void. Neither party can enforce it and neither party can have any obligations under it. Voidable. The parties may choose to avoid the contract and treat it uh, as being at an end or treat it as existing and enforce it against the offending party illegal the contract is not enforceable by by the court so that was lesson two uh, let's go to lesson three lesson three to talk about contract breach and terminations <clears throat> excuse me breach of contract a breach is a failure to fulfill or perform any obligation under a contract by one of the contracting parties if the breach does not go to the root of the contract, it may give rise to a right of the impacted party to sue for damages. Without the option of discharge, uh, without the option to discharge the contract, this is sometimes referred to as a minor or compensate, compensable breach. Remedies for a breach of contract. Five remedies available in relation to a breach of contract involving real property. Uh, these are rescission, revocation, a revocation or cancellation of a, co a contract, damages, compensation for losses incurred, quantum merit, a reasonable sum of services rendered, uh, specific for performance, party in breach to carry out specific obligations, injunction, restrain the offending party from breaking a promise. Termination of a contract, five methods to terminate a contract involve uh, real property, uh, re involving real property are uh, performance, which is obligations of the performing party are fulfilled and the right of the other party are satisfied. Mutual agreement, contract discharged by mutual consent to the party that it shall no longer bind them. Impossibility of performance, unanticipated uh, circumstances arising after the making of a contract are held to release the party from their obligation. Operation of law, discharge, <coughs> excuse me, Discharge of contract by law, example, death of a party, bankruptcy, or unauthorized uh, un unilateral uh, altercation of contractual terms. Breach, breaking of a contract by one of the parties uh, resulting in uh, 
conferring a right of legal action on the party injured by the breach. That was lesson three. So they talk about breach of contract and the remedies and the terminations that may come with it. Lesson four, they talk about the Electronic Commerce Act. Electronic Commerce Act basically is, uh, they don't really talk about it that much, but let's just go over it. Uh, what is the purpose, purpose of Electronic Commerce Act? Uh, the purpose, or uh, what does it do? It regulates, govern, uh, it regu it, its regulations govern the creation, recording, transmission, and storage of contracts electronically. The purpose of this act is to allow any legal relationship that requires paper documents to be considered legal and enforceable when it is in electronic format. It, it provides that legal requirement of a document to be signed or endorsed can be satisfied by electronic signatures. Um, which contract uh, the documents of a brokerage can be signed electronically? Uh, brokerages to use any uh, electronic signature for all agreements relating to trade. So any, anything with agreement of purchase, agreement of sale, agreement of to lease. Um, so that was pretty, that's pretty much it, to be honest, for lesson four. Lesson four really talks about uh, using electronic signatures, electronic commerce, okay. Let's go back to lesson five. Lesson five is complying with privacy leg legislation. Let's see what this uh, lesson talks about. So there are 10 privacy principles. The essence of PIPTA is uh, identified in 10 principles of privacy by the Canadian Standards Association Group that applies to all sales salespersons and brokerages. The 10 privacy principles are accountability, identifying purpose, consent, limiting collection, limiting use, disclosure, and retention, accuracy, safeguard, openness, individual access, and challenging challenging compliance. Three types of information. So PIPTA applies to two types of information, personal information and sensitive personal information. The details easily associated with the person is considered personal information, such as a place of residence and further sensitive data, such as health conditions is considered sensitive information. PIPTA does not uh, uh, apply to personal facts which are non-identifiable, such as the data in a dem demography, uh, demographic analysis. Uh, typical policies and privacy uh, officer at the brokerage. PIPTA requires that the brokerages must have a designated privacy officer to formulate and implement the policies and procedures, procedures for PIPTA co uh, compliance. The privacy officer must ensure adequate levels of security are set up to ensure safe keeping of the data at the brokerage. The typical policies at the brokerage to comply uh, with PIPTA include preparing a brochure for clients slash customers, explaining the privacy le legislation and how their information would be protected. A salesperson is obligated to state the purpose of obtaining information and get consent for using the information for the persons supplying the information. The salesperson has to maintain the privacy of files, records by safeguarding physical documents in locked cabinets and password protecting electronic files. So that was lesson five. Let me just make sure I have everything for lesson five. Um, so they, I said PIPTA. Do you guys know what PIPTA is? Okay, let's just t talk about PIPTA. PIPTA is... Uh, hmm. It doesn't say. T -d -d -d. Oh, PIPTA is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Oh, sets out requirements on how this information can be collected and used by a salesperson. Okay, makes sense. So that was lesson five. Pretty straightforward. It just uh, protects the customer's uh, personal information and uh, all these facts. Lesson six talks about family law, the Family Law Act. This one is pretty easy. It should be um, very easy to do. 
the matrimonial homes, uh, the Family Law Act defines as matrimonial home as every property in which a person has an interest or that is if the spouse has been separated was the time of separation ordinarily occupied by the person and his or her spouse as their family residence of matrimonial home. Okay, so You should read on that. On the other hand, matrimonial property would be an any family asset not considered to be the matrimonial home with exceptions, exceptions such as inheritance and insurance settlement. It is important that you as a salesperson know that the distinction between a matrimonial home and a matrimonial property. Both spouses have an equal right to possession of a matrimonial home. The act confirms that the right rights of a non-owner spouse to uh, equal possession of a matrimonial home. This right is a personal one and is not an interest in land. The act further provides that the spouse has a right to be notified any proceeding by a third party that could affect the possess possessory right. The registered owner cannot dispose of or encumber the matrimonial home without the consent of other spouse. So that is uh, spouse matrimonial homes. According to the Family Act Law, there can be more than one matrimonial home. Uh, as a salesperson, you will need to understand the Family Law Act to be able to clarify the ownership of the property. If there is any question as the status of a matrimonial home, the seller should seek qualified legal advice. Matrimonial home rights are extended to the spouse who is a non-owner or whose name is not presented, uh, present, present on the title of the property. The rights of a non-titled spouse in a matrimonial home are listed as follows. If a property is designated as a matrimonial home, both spouses have equal right of possession. Um, the act further provides that a non-owner spouse has a right to be notified uh, of any proceeding by a third party that could affect that pos uh, possessory right. So that is just matrimonial home. Um, I think you should read on that. It's not that here's the sun so basically as a salesperson you should remember any property occupied jointly by married spouses may be considered a matrimony home unless designated otherwise by them any property can be designated as a matrimony home by joint registration by both spouses and there can be more than one matrimony home both spouses have equal right to possession of the matrimony home including a non uh, owner spouse the registered owner cannot dispose of or encumber the matrimony home without the consent of, a, of the other spouse. So that's lesson six, basically just summarized it for you. Uh, lesson seven uh, talks about the impact of the Planning Act and official plan on land and development. Let's go to lesson seven. So lesson seven, uh, seven the summary of this uh, lesson is basically as a salesperson, you will be able to need you will need to be uh, uh, cogn cognizant of the permissible use of a property and the land use in the vicinity of a property and its impact on the value of the property. Municipalities classified as either upper tier or lower tier have the authority to implement local planning as per the Planning Act. You should recognize that the Planning Act sets out the ground rules for land use planning in Ontario gives general admin, administrative control of the planning system in Ontario to Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, sets out specific provincial interests to outline what is considered to be sound planning uh, within the province, authorizes the Ministry of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing to issue provincial policy statements on matters relating um, uh, to a municipal planning, uh, mineral aggravated resources, floodplains, housing, and wetlands. Establishes uh, perimeter parameters uh, for the development of uh, official plan, planning documents for geography, geographic uh, areas approved by the Ministry of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing. So that's lesson seven. Lesson seven, I think you should read it yourself. The summary wasn't that in uh, detailed because when I read lesson seven, it was way more detailed. Lesson eight summary, key considerations uh, related to zoning. Uh, so things you should know are um, zoning by law. 
So the zoning bylaws are enacted by the municipalities setting out permitted uses, building structure standards, example, minimum setbacks and law coverage, and other necessary regulations, such as, excuse me, such as uh, signage, noise, and parking. Zones are further broken into classifications, example, residential, and subclassifications, example, single family, each with its own detailed standard. Uh, zoning by law implements the objective and policies of a municipality official plan is the legal instruct instrument of, for managing land use and uh, future development. It protects the community from conflict, uh, conflicting and possible dangerous land uses, and it controls the use of land. And the other thing to talk about is that the zoning bylaw typically uh, divides and classifies the entire land mass of, of a municipality into a minimum of six general uses, residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, open space, and agriculture. Each class is further, further subdivided into subclasses or zones indicated with appropriate symbols. For example, residential would be symbolized as R, agriculture would be symbolized as AG, and uh, uh, residential would further be categorized as R1, R2, R3, etc. Um, so that is basically how, how they designate the uh, different zones. And so the typical zoning bylaws, uh, typical residential bylaws, sorry, uh, are sign bylaw directing how signage should be used on a property, parking bylaws establishing parking rules for vehicle, vehicles on the street and in driveways of the municipality, noise bylaws uh, that establish uh, when, how, and how much noise is permitted in any particular area of the municipality. The Committee of Adjustment is appointed by the Municipal Council of Lower Tier Municipality. So let me read that again. The Committee of Adjustment is appointed by the Municipal Council of the Lower Tier Municipality. The Land Division Committee, appointed by the Upper Tier Municipality, performs sil similar per functions. The Committee of Adjustment has three functions. Grant minor variances, providing consent to sever land, granting consents for the con continuation of a non-confirming use. And some of them, uh, a minor variance for planning purposes is generally described as a small variation or slight modification concerning a particular property in relation to bylaws in force with, within a municipality. Rezoning is required when a property owner wants to use a property in a manner not permitted in the zoning bylaw and is seeking an amendment amendment to permit the intended use. Amending a zoning bylaw is more complex and expensive an expensive process than a, mi than a minor variance as it impacts the entire zoning area and can affect several properties. Understandably, in such requests, the municipal, municipal council and interested stakeholders need to be involved. Uh, Non-confirming use and non-confirming structures. As a, result, re, as a result of rezoning initiatives, some properties and existing structures may, no, may no longer comply with the new zoning bylaws. When this occurs, these properties and structures are referred to as uh, non-conforming. Non -conforming. As a salesperson, you should advise the buyer that an independent third party professional such as a lawyer or a certified planner um, be consulted when a non-conforming pr property or structure is being sold. Non-confirming use or uh, structures may be recognized as legal non-conforming because they complied with the zoning bylaws at the time they were established. So that was lesson eight. Let's head on to lesson nine. Lesson nine is land severances and plans of subdivision. So um, consent granting authority. Depending where the, where the land is located, permissions to sever land usually rest with the local land division, uh, local land division committee or committee of adjustments, where are which are appointed by the municipality or the corporation responsible for overseeing the subject land under the Planning Act. The minister, the minister of municipal affairs and housing, also appoint such committees 
or grant consents in certain areas of the province. Land severance is the approved separation of a piece of land to form typically two or three lots from an already existing larger piece of land and is normally called a consent. Landowners must apply for an approval and obtain consent to sever as an in, in uh, as the indiscriminate uh, division of land could have a long-term negative impact on the community. A regulation under the Planning Act sets out the procedures procedure rules for land severance uh, land severance consent of applications the outlines of steps uh, for obtaining approval for land severances are consult before applying to determine authority submit complete application review of application by consent granting authority decision notice of this decision and appeal to the local planning appeal to tribunal tribunal uh, issuing a certificate and next is a uh, land uh, subdivision and steps for approval when a landowner wishes to divide one property into many lots plan of subdivision registration is required by completing the necessary steps outlined in the planning act registration is a two-way stage process draft plan approval and final plan approval the outlines of step uh, steps for obtaining approval for subdivision are consult before determining, uh, applying to determine authority, submit complete application, review the application by consent granting authority, decision or draft plan approval, notice of decision, appeal to the local planning uh, appeal tribunal, final plan approval and registration and sale of the lots. Local planning uh, and appeal tribunal tribunal is an ad, uh, adjudicative, adjudicative tribunal that hears cases in concerning a range of municipal planning, financial and land matters, appeal, and appeals in cases on, uh, of non-decision in severance or subdivision. The Local Planning Appeal Support Center, establishing, established under the Local Planning Appeal Support Center, was a local planning appeal support, support center which helps people understand and navigate the land use planning and appeal processes in Ontario. So that is uh, lesson nine, basically. Let's go over to lesson 10. Lesson 10, they talk about authority of a municipality. So let's go to that. So a quick summary of this lesson is most parties in uh, sorry most properties in the province are situated within a certain municipality as a salesperson you should understand how municipalities are governed uh, to work efficiently within the system in order to consult the appropriate office to provide the correct information to sellers or buyers you must know when to refer clients to more experienced local salespersons when necessary as a salesperson you should be aware that the federal government oversees airport facilities, lands, uh, ocean fisheries, uh, land adjacent to Great Lakes, federal can, uh, canal systems, and may also be involved in provincial planning. Municipalities provide the most local form of government and, infra and infrastructure to a commu community. Municipalities have a major role in the framework of the Planning Act and establishing uh, bylaws for the properties within their jurisdiction. The Municipal Act uh, is the main statute that the government uh, that governs the creation, administration, and the governance of Ontario municipalities. Due to its uh, significance, uh, size, and sub uh, subsequent uh, responsibilities, a separate municipal statute example, the City of Toronto Act, was enacted uh, to govern the operation of the city. There are 10 areas of uh, uh, sphere of influence. Sphere of influence uh, means the new le legislation sets up 10 spheres of influence over which municipalities, uh, government, uh, municipal governments have authority subject to certain limitations. <clears throat> So, uh, in, uh, which includes uh, utilities, waste management, transportation systems, drainage and flood control, parking, animals, economic development services, etc. 
So that's basically the summary of lesson 10. Let's go over to lesson 11. Lesson 11 uh, talks about compliance with FinTract. What is FinTract? The FinTract, so FinTract is the Financial Transactions and Report Analysis Center of Canada, FinTract. Uh, so that is that. Uh, it, uh, so basically, it is Canada's Financial Intelligence Unit and it, is, uh, it has established several guidelines for institutions that engage in financial transactions, including real estate brokerages. Uh, FinTract has the uh, mandate to facilitate the detention, uh, sorry, detection, prevention, and deterrence of money laundering and financing of terrorist activities, which while ensuring the protection of personal information under its control, FinTract is responsible for ensuring compliance with the uh, proceeds of crime, money laundering, and terrorist finance act. So, FinTrack requirements and responsibilities. Uh, each salesperson and brokerage in Ontario is subject to reporting requirements set out by FinTrack. Salespersons and brokerages must fulfill the re responsibilities to ensure um, compliance with FinTrack. Every broker must appoint a compliance of, uh, officer to implement and oversee compliance with the proceeds of crime and uh, terrorist financing act um, report suspicious transactions and maintain its record report large ca uh, cash transactions example ten thousand dollars or more uh, maintain a record of every receipt of funds property uh, report property in their possession or control that is owned or controlled by or on behalf of a terrorist organization. A salesperson uh, and brokerages, uh, brokerage are required to collect the documentations, uh, sorry, documents or as required, including documents of client information, uh, unrepresented party records, and records of reasonable measures taken to meet obligation, obligations of uh, proceeds of crime. Uh, and the brokerage the documents must be retained by the brokerage for a period of five years. So the penalties, either criminal or administrative administrative uh, monetary penalties uh, may be imposed in situations of uh, non-compliance with proceeds of crime. Um, when determining the penalty amount, the FinTrack considers the following cat category, um, uh, sorry, following cat criteria. Harm caused, harm caused by the violations, uh, compliance history of, of the reporting entity, non-punitive uh, nature of an administrative monetary penalty. So basically that is uh, lesson 11 really just uh, talks about FinTract, the Financial Transaction and Reports Analyst Center of Canada. Let's move on to lesson 12. We still have three more lessons to go. So lesson 12 talks about key legislative requirements impacting condominiums. Let's go over the summary here. So a condominium corporation, a condominium is legally created when both a declaration, a declaration, the condominium constitution and the description, the diagrammatic representation of the property are registered at the applicable land registry office. Condominium Authority and Training for Condominium Boards To streamline dis disputes between the condominium owners and the board, the Protecting Con Condominium a Owners Act created two independent authorities, the Condominium Authority of Ontario and the Condominium Management Authority of Ontario. Condominiums are operated uh, by a board of uh, directors on behalf of the unit owners. Directors are required to complete mandatory training established and conducted by the Condominium Authority of Ontario. Uh, condominium reserve funds. All condominiums have a reserve fund. A, re a reserve fund is a special amount, uh, sorry, a special account with a regulated financial institution. Regulated financial institutions such as a bank, loan, and a trust corporation or a credit unit, sorry. The account must be separate from the condominium operating fund and it is, it is used to pay for major repairs and replacement. Uh, for the condominiums common elements. Uh, example, 
uh, road, sidewalk, electrical, and heating, plumbing systems, and all that stuff. The convert converted condominiums. The conversions uh, of warehouses and industrial structures into residential condominiums lofts that incorporate some of the building's more interesting features such as large windows, framing, brick walls into the design are becoming more popular as municipalities look to uh, repurpose is the existing building stocks. The industry term uh, for these uh, types of de developments is residential condominium conversion project. The key provisions of Condominium Act are uh, rules, regulations, and bylaws, board of directors, uh, board of director duty, sorry, uh, adequacy of reserve funds, common expenses, statute certificate, and restrictions to owner alter alterations and additions. The Condominium Management Regulatory uh, Authority of Ontario is the administrator administrative body that oversees the act the condominium management Reg regulatory authority of ontario is also the training and licensing authority of condominium managers condominium managers must act ethically as the executive function on behalf of the condominium corporation the code of ethics in the condominium management service act that generally obligate um, the general obligations of a condominium management uh, sorry managers and condominium management companies in terms of professionalism reliability and quality of service condominium complaints and resolutions if a condominium owner or a tenant has a dispute with a licensed condominium manager or the management service providing a provider company the condominium management regulatory authority of ontario is entrusted and with impartial assessment of concerns and complaints so that was lesson 12. Let's move on to lesson 13. Lesson 13 talks about differentiating between residential and commercial tenancies. So <clears throat> here I'm just gonna read the quick summary of it and then I'm gonna go back. Actually, let's just do this. So the difference between the residential, uh, a residential and a commercial uh, tenancy act are, let's read the summary. As a salesperson, you must be able to discuss the rights and duties of tenants and lower landlords when leasing with residential or commercial properties. These include uh, to identify the type of tenancy, uh, the principal use of the property, uh, is a good start of a, is a good starting point in commercial tenancies uh, rent deposit is permitted without restriction where in residential tenancies rent deposit must not amount to more than the agreed uh, rent for one rent per one rental period in commercial tenancies there are no restrictions on the rent increase as per the commercial uh, tenancy uh, act where in the residential tenancies uh, no landlord may increase the rent by more than the guideline uh, except in accordance with the Residential Tenancy Act. In commercial tenancies, dis disputes uh, are resolved, resolved at the Superior Court of Justice where in residential uh, tenancy, the landlord and tenant board uh, has jurisdiction. So they just talk about uh, security deposit and rent increase pretty straightforward it's a small lesson you, you should read that and lesson 14 are that's pretty much it for module 6 I've covered everything let's go over the whole module summary see if we missed out anything um, yeah the whole module summary basically identifies everything we need to know uh, the impact uh, Identify planning act impacting the salesperson. Uh, in order to better understand the influence of a municipality on property, salesperson should be aware that the authority of a municipality under the municipal act and the authority of the city of Toronto under the city of Toronto, as well as the ten spheres of influence. Yeah, it's everything that we already talked about. So, guys, that was module six. I hope it helped. 
Um, I've summarized basically each lesson. Um, there are some important information in there, so I suggest you read that as well. And uh, that's it. I'm gonna be making my next video on module seven, and uh, hopefully, uh, it helps you. Uh, thanks, thanks for watching this whole video. I know it was a long one, but I uh, hope it helped, and I'll see you guys next. Thank you. Bye.